Good morning, good morning. I'm Diane Robertson. I'm the political committee chair for the Chapel Hill Carborough NAACP, and I am really glad to see this great crowd on a Thursday morning. And what better day to be here? Yeah, give yourself a hand. What a great day to be here and acknowledge the importance of the Voting Rights Act passed 50 years ago on this day. That's the kind of history we should be celebrating. That's the history that has, ma that has made and will continue to make this a better country and a better community. And uh, not the history that others are trying to force us into, or the story. I w I'm not even going to say it's history, but I'll leave that to the hi historian today. I'd like to ask uh, Tom Balot, Reverend Tom Balot, to come up and do the, ben uh, the invocation for us this morning. Good morning. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we gather today, empower us to speak the truth about the past so that we might shine a light on the true meaning of hateful symbols. As we gather today, empower us to speak the truth about the present because we know that our advancement comes from diversity and not division. As we gather today, empower us to imagine a future that we know is only possible through love and truth. God, you've commanded us not to bear false witness, so we come to tell the truth about history and the use of its symbols. God, you've commanded us not to worship false idols, so we come to proclaim that those who worship the Confederate flag are worshiping falsely. As we come together on this day, exactly, exactly the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act, let us praise worthy accomplishments and not shameful legacies. Chasten this society in which we live. Help us to imagine glorious monuments to justice and liberation instead of sick monuments to slavery and racism. Chasten us, teach us to wave flags of courage and vision, not flags of fear. Shame us, show us to parade banners that proclaim the strength of our diversity and not the poisonous lie of white supremacy. We pray as a people of diverse faiths, but sharing together one respect, one love, and one great unity. Amen. powerful, the faith leaders that have been at the front of this movement since it began. We thank you for that, Reverend Block. I also would like to introduce and bring up our uh, presidents of the three branches of the NAACP that are sponsoring this event, and each of them will make their own welcome remarks to you. Let's see. Good morning. Good morning. I bring you greetings from the Northern Orange Branch of the NAACP. To all that has gathered with us today, know that no matter what happens in the days ahead, for people that want to repeat or live in the past of the Confederacy, we will stand together from this day forward to show Orange County, other surrounding communities, and the state that we will not be moved or turned back until economic equality education reform, health care, and voting rights. Thank you. Have a good day. Good morning. My name is Barrett Brown. I'm the president of the Alamance branch of the NAACP. We are pleased to help host this event because a few weeks ago after the Charleston massacre, there was some discussion about removing the Confederate monument from our town square. And that discussion was met with a rally and protest the next weekend of people who were really busy spreading uh, misinformation about what the Civil Rights, I mean what the Civil War was about and what the legacy of the Confederacy was. A group called Take Elements Back led a protest and I want to know where they want to take us back to. This is a movement, this is a movement in a time where we are coming together to move Alamance County and the state of North Carolina forward. We don't want to go back to, not one step back, we don't want to go back to desegregation and 
I mean, to integration and to uh, segregation and to uh, all of the things that are part of that Confederate racist movement. Um, we're also pleased to be here on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. The, uh, this is a remarkable time because the Supreme Court has ruled, rolled back a significant part of the, uh, the Voter Rights Act and our own legislature is involved in vote, passing laws about voter suppression. And that is basically the same nullification and interposition that Martin Luther King talked about in the 60s. So thank you for coming here today. Thank you for your support as we move North Carolina forward. Thank you. I'm Minister Robert Campbell from the Chapel, Chapel Hill Carver branch of the NAACP. I want to welcome you once again for participating in this. But I want to go into a, a different pathway. I served in the United States Navy under the banner of the Stars and Stripes, the United States flag of America that stand for unity, that binds us together regardless of race, creed, or color. And I learned through that that the diversity that was within my task force, that we were brothers in battle, brothers in war, and brothers at the dinner table. We forged friendships that have lasted since 1969 when I first met the group. I became one of their enlisted men petty officers that when we went in battle, we were a diverse group, but we was unified. We upheld the bravery and the honor of the flag of the United States of America. And not one, even though we came from different parts of the United States, not one of them banished a Confederate flag mm -hmm. or is in symbols. We were the military, but we are now the citizens of the United States of America. The diversity that I see here is the legacy that we should pass to our young folks. Education, health care, living wage, right. affordable housing, that's where our energy should be. Yes. How do we make and keep America the power that it is, even with the relationship through community service that I have with law enforcement encourages me to stay out in the front to help bring forth changes that will benefit us all. Yes, we are here today to say we will not go back. No. We are moving forward, not one step back. Here's Burr. Is, the, is our county seat for a diverse people. And diversity is what democracy looks like. This is the seed, and this is the banner that we want to pass on to our young folks. Hate has no place in our society, nor it assembles. The word of God said, love cover a many mother to a sin. And hate is at the top of the list. We got to bring it down. And I want to thank you for being here to take part in this today. Thank you very much. Wow. 
So I want you to look at the three presidents that are here and make sure you find one of them at the end because you all want to be a part of these organizations because these are the people that are helping to make North Carolina the state that it should become. So meet them afterwards and give them your name and say, when's your meeting? I want to be there. I want to welcome, uh, and we have a really wonderful turnout of elected officials here today, um, Mayor Stevens and members of the Hillsborough Town Council, and I just ask you to raise your hands where you are to be recognized. I live in Carborough. I'm really proud of the big contingent that's over here from Carborough, Lydia Lavelle and uh, the town of Alderman from Carborough are here. Mayor Mark Kleinschmidt and members of the uh, Chapel Hill Town Council are here. I've seen several members from the County Board of Commissioners. Uh, if you'll raise your hand so that folks will know you're here representing them. Sheriff Blackwood and his team are here. We thank them for being here supporting us as well as keeping, our, keeping us safe. Representative Greg Meyer sends his best wishes and his support. He is uh, in the trenches in Raleigh doing the people's business, as is Senator Fushi, who also sent statements of support in uh, what we're doing here today. Faith leaders have been at the forefront, as I said, of this movement from the beginning, and we have several faith leaders here, so if I didn't recognize you, please raise your hands and let folks know that you're here with us today because your spiritual and moral support is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And if I left anybody out, you know, like they send me at Oscars, I apologize. Um, so you are in for a real treat. I have had a preamble of some of the remarks that are going to be made, and so I'm not going to keep you any longer. I would like to introduce historian and my friend Timothy Tyson, who will give you a direction of how to think about some of the things that are happening today. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. Representative Marilyn Avila, who's a Republican from Raleigh, was arguing in favor of the new mandatory Confederate Monument Act. She was saying, when you talk about memorials and remembrances, the point of time at which they were erected is extremely relevant. Now she was right about that. Only problem is she had no idea when that happened. She said that the Confederate monuments went up shortly after the war between the states. If somebody had tried to put Confederate monuments all over North Carolina shortly after the Civil War, there would have been another one. The, un the unanimous white South is nothing but a cherished myth. White North Carolinians erected nearly all of the Confederate monuments after 1898 half a century or more after the Civil War ended. More importantly, white North Carolinians built the monuments after the white supremacy campaigns had seized the government of North Carolina and had taken the vote away from African Americans. The monuments reflected as much that moment of, of uh, white ascendancy as they did the legacy of the Confederacy. For example, if you look at the the, the uh, Confederate monument at UNC Chapel Hill, better known as Silent Sam. At its dedication in 1913, Julian S. Carr, uh, an industrialist, bragged in his speech that he had, quote, horsewhipped a Negro wench until her skirts hung in shreds because she had publicly insulted a Southern lady, unquote. He heralded, quote, the Anglo-Saxon race in the South reunited with itself with white supremacy as the glue. During the, the actual Civil War, the actual Confederacy bitterly divided white North Carolinians. This was the last Southern state to secede. 
Alamance County, I don't know the, the figures for Orange County, but Alamance County, in the only time that it was permitted to vote on secession, voted 1,114 to 254 against secession. There remained a persistent outcry of moral dissent. Thousands of whites even took up arms against the Confederacy and far more refused to accept its authority. Thousands of black North Carolinians escaped slavery and served in the Union Army. Confederate officials complained that Eastern North Carolina was infested with disloyal persons and Western North Carolina was heavenly Unionist. Government, <coughs> Confederate Governor Zebulon Vance called the Civil War when he was campaigning in 1864 a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, and he threatened to take North Carolina out of the Confederacy. The 1862 Confederate Conscription Act, which exempted prosperous slaveholders from serving in the Confederate military, that turned many more people against the war. North Carolina's own internal civil war uh, began in earnest. From the coastal swamps to the Blue Ridge, anti-Confederate guerrillas, unionists, and runaway slaves battled the Confederacy. Parts of North Carolina became virtually ungovernable. Alamance and, and Hillsborough were a hotbed of resistance to con the Confederacy and home to hundreds of the so-called Red Strings, which was an anti-Confederate guerrilla group. There were thousands and thousands of them in the state, but hundreds and hundreds of them in this community. Yes. <laughs> Campaigning for re-election in 1864, Governor Vance also declared, the great popular heart is not now and never has been in this war. It was a revolution of the politicians and not the people. The notion that the Confederacy somehow represents white North Carolina's heritage is not historical, but political. There are, rough, there are roughly 100 Confederate monuments in North Carolina today, most of them on public property, five of them on the Capitol grounds in Raleigh, where they would seem to represent all of us. There are no monuments to the enslaved that That's built right. our state. Right. There are none for the interracial reconstruction government of the late 1860s in which black and white came together and wrote the Constitution under which we're still trying to live. Yes. 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 That black and white coalition also built perhaps the nation's first system of free tax supported public schools until they were overthrown amid a campaign of ruthless Ku Klux Klan violence. Our State House displays no statues to celebrate the interracial fusion movement of the 1890s, which could have led us into a different kind of South. No monuments stand on our courthouse lawns to the interracial civil rights movement. There are no statues of Abraham Galloway, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, Ella Baker, Julius Chambers. <laughs> Only one side of our racial history gets public monuments in North Carolina. The Confederates and the white supremacy campaign at the turn of the 20th century. And yet, the histories that we leave out of the public square speak lessons far more relevant to our predicaments at this moment than the Confederates. The new Mandatory Confederate Monument Act denies communities the right to decide how they will mark their own local history. In truth, this law is not about history so much as it is it about current power arrangements. The extremists are trying to cement their power in place much like their ridiculous law cements the Confederate monuments in place. But I'll warn them now, not even Art Pope can buy you that kind of cement.
this legislation is not about preserving the history of the Civil War. Instead, it will be remembered as a monument to racial gerrymandering, racially driven voting laws, a war on the public schools, and to its author's quaking fear of a different kind of North Carolina. Let me close with the words of a great Southerner, President Lyndon Johnson, as he stood in the well of the House of Representatives 50 years ago to argue for the Voting Rights Act. He said, it is not just black people, but it is really all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. So another plug for the NAACP, we have the best NAACP in the country, not just and we are very fortunate to have as our state education director an esteemed award-winning and brilliant historian like Tim Tyson. And I would like to now introduce Laurel Ashton who is our field secretary for the state branch of the NAACP and she has some special remarks for you. In just a few days, right where we stand, people will come from surrounding counties for a Southern Heritage educational rally. Not just any rally, an educational rally. I find this characterization especially disturbing about this pro-Confederate event, this characterization of education, of accuracy, of truth. When we equate Southern Heritage with pro-Confederate rhetoric and symbols, we are falling victim to the lie of Southern heritage, a lie that so many of my white brothers and sisters have been fed for their entire lives. It is a lie that many have learned not only to accept, but to love, to see as intrinsic to who they are and their place in this world. I grew up in Buncombe County, in the mountains of North Carolina, and I've met many people who embrace the lie of Southern heritage white people who have been taught that symbols of the Confederacy represent their history. But we know that that's not true. Dr. Tyson showed us that that's not true. An accurate reading of history shows us that most Confederate monuments were erected 50 years after the war to celebrate a successful campaign of violent white terrorism to crush Reconstruction. Right. An accurate reading of history shows us that it wasn't until the 1950s when the Confederate flag became mainstream, after a rise in white supremacy groups following the passage of Brown v. Board of Education. An accurate reading of history shows us that while it was a war waged by slaveholders, they were exempt from fighting. Instead, it was poor Southerners that faced this burden. In North Carolina, it was these folks who, with no stake in the fight, fought, died, and often fled the Confederacy, sometimes to take up arms against it. Dr. Tyson told us, but sometimes you have to say it again because it's just that important. This Saturday, my white brothers and sisters who gather here won't be educated. They won't be enlightened. They will be lied to. An all too familiar lie of Southern heritage. For a rally like this to take place, and let's be true, clear about what this rally really is, it is a rally to glorify the symbols of a war fought to maintain slavery. Right. Symbols representing centuries yeah. of violent white terror against people of color. For a rally like this to take place, not just in 2015, but only seven weeks after nine men and women were buried in the ground, assassinated by a man armed with symbols of, white, of the Confederacy. For a rally like this to take place here and now, there must be a climate of acceptance. A climate that is set by our very own elected officials. But while other southern states are proactively taking steps forward, they have chosen to stand still. Governor McCrory and the General Assembly have stood still when faced with requests to remove Confederate license plates. In fact, the only action 
our legislature has taken was to protect Confederate monuments, to remove the ability of local governments to decide for themselves. But let me tell you what the real tragedy is. The tragedy is that these very people, those who will drive through the Piedmont waving Confederate flags converging here in this courtyard, these very people, many of whom are poor and face systems of economic oppression daily, are hurting and sometimes even dying because of the policies passed by our elected officials at the state legislature. It is these poor white Southerners who are so often without health care, who are underpaid and need a raise in the minimum wage, who have children struggling in under-resourced public schools, who live alongside black folks in rural communities where they can't drink the water because of the lack of environmental protections. Yes. It is these poor white folks who need access to affordable women's health care, who need an end to the death penalty, who need emergency unemployment and earned income tax credit. But instead, they get a flag and a monument. And they have been fooled into believing that this is enough. The lie of Southern heritage is more than just a lie, it is a tool, a very dangerous tool of division. Those white folks will see the legislators who pass this bill, who refuse to act on Confederate license plates and who use racialized rhetoric to gain support as their champions. The very people who are hurting them, their children, their schools and their environment. The very people who have chosen to protect symbols of white supremacy over the people of North Carolina, over the very people who will gather here in two days. They will stand here to defend a lie, a lie of Southern heritage, rather than standing here with us today, rather than recognizing our shared humanity, our shared history, and our shared best interests, rather than moving forward together, not one step back. <laughs> Well, if my name wasn't Reverend Barber, I wouldn't want to speak after that. <laughs> he needs no introduction, and as I said earlier, not just the leader of the best NAACP movement in the state, in the country, but the largest and most active moral movement right now in the world. <laughs> I want to first um, ask that members of the clergy and mayors that will would come a little closer if you're out in the audience and join us. This is the time that we must be seen. The Bible says, don't put your light under a bushel. Now, um, I get no joy out of being here today. It's a great deal of sadness about this state which also but it's not the kind of sadness that makes you go somewhere and be depressed it's the kind of sadness that makes you want to stand up mm -hmm. be counted first thing i want us to do and i want the media to get this is for everybody for just a second to join hands with somebody and try to intentionally be somebody whose color is not yours and i want the media just to pan around and see that we are United. I just want them to see it. In fact, why don't we just lift them up if you can so they can really see them. Say forward together. Forward together. Not one step back. Not one step back. Fifty days ago, on the evening of June 17, 2015, a mass assassination, murder, terrorist act by a gunman inspired by the racist meaning 
of the Confederate battle flag, among other things, took place at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, Zion Episcopal Church, in downtown Charleston, excuse me, AME. The first, AME was the first formal African American denomination founded in America and it came into being because one day black people were snatched off of their knees while in prayer and told that they had, they had to go to the in heavens, I won't say the word, which was the balconies, which is why back in the day many white congregations had balconies because African Americans, even when they went into church, were forced to be segregated. They were killed during a prayer service. Just like years ago, a slave rebellion in that same church was being planned during a prayer service. And Denmark Vesey and many others would be assassinated. They were killed by a gunman, including the senior pastor, the Reverend Clemente Pickney, 50 days ago. Say 50 days ago. 50 days later, our state legislature, led by Speaker Tim Moore, who's from Shelby, where the author of Birth of the Nation is from, where Dalen Roof ran to find shelter, and Senator League of Berger, signed by Governor McCory. Fifty days later in our state, they have signed and put into action the first bill after the Charleston Massacre to protect Confederate monuments. Even those with the battle flags on them, above them, or engraved in them. And they have refused to ban Confederate battle flag emblems from North Carolina license tags. Today, we gather on the 50th anniversary. Say 50 days ago. 50 days ago. Say 50 days later. 50 days later. And then say the 50th anniversary. 50th anniversary. Today is the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, remembering that 50 years ago, all over the South today, August 6, 50 years ago, those committed to white supremacy were waving Confederate flags in defiance of the signing of the Voting Rights Act because it nullified and made illegal throughout especially the racialized voting South any procedure that sought to suppress and deny the black vote. And we gather here on this day, 50 days after Charleston, 50 days our legislature and governor have enacted this law, and 50 years after the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Our current legislature and governor will protect monuments and flags of our racist past that fuels racism in our present, but they refuse to protect voting rights. They will fast track a bill to protect Confederate monuments and battle flags, but they will not protect 900,000 working poor black, white, and Latino people that need earned income tax credits. They are making North Carolina the mockery of the nation. We used to be first in flight and first in academic and first in university systems. And now we are first in co protecting the Confederate flag and its monuments after Charleston. 
They'll protect the monument of a past, but will not expand Medicaid to 500,000 people. 346,000, by the way, who are white. And many who may come out here on Saturday and need the very Medicaid. They would rather the government protect the flag than keep them alive. They'll protect the monument and the flag, but will not properly protect public education. And thousands of teachers assistants right now and teachers don't even know if they will have a job because while they're protecting Confederate flags and while they're voting against the LGBT community, they are actually not doing what they were elected to do and that is pass a budget that fully supports public education. This governor and legislature are constitutionally out of order. And their policies are morally troubling. In fact, more than troubling, they are morally deficient. They'll protect the monument, but they won't raise living wages. And some of the people that will come here with that flag need money they go back home and put in the gas tank to get back home and don't even realize that we are fighting for them when we are fighting for a raising in a living way. They will protect a monument of the past but won't protect the climate in the present in which all of us have to live. Instead they support coal ash and fracking and things that will destroy our climate today. They will protect a flag and monuments of a lost cause, of a terrorist action. That's what the Confederate Army, it was a terrorist activity. It was not the Union Army versus the Confederate Army. It was the Army of the United States versus terrorists and secessionists. And they will protect that and won't protect equal protection for the LGBTQ community and women's rights and women's health yeah. and the immigrant community. Free, yeah. Free, yeah. Free, yeah. 50 years after the signing of the Voting Rights Act and 50 days after the terroristic murder of nine souls in Charleston, this is the sad place that we are in with our leadership. And it's immoral, it's constitutionally inconsistent, it's economically insane, and it's dangerous. Remember what Dr. King said when four girls were blown up in the Birmingham church. He said, what killed these girls is every preacher that stays behind their stained glass windows and refuses to get involved preach, preach. in the cause of justice. Preach, preach. And then he said, what killed these girls is every politician that has fed their constituents the stale bread of hatred mm. and the spoiled meat of racism. Making this kind of legislation and fast tracking it is dangerous. You see all these cops out here just for us to have a meeting waving the American flag? They know something. They know how sick some of this stuff can be. Because this kind of pushing forward by the leaders at the top of our political, political um, process serves up once again the stale bread of hatred and the spoil made of racism and it legitimizes it. They may think it's just mere political propaganda. They may think it's just reviving the, the tactics of Jesse Ham for a few votes in 2016, but it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And it's divisive. It is. The governor and others have said this is about heritage. Governor, please don't cancel liberal arts in any of our universities. Instead, take a class in history. Because you are right and wrong, and that's 
that's that's kind of dangerous. The book of James says a double-minded man is unsteady in all his ways. You are right. It's about heritage. But what heritage? 154 years ago, the vice president of the outlaw Confederate domestic terrorist army plain and clearly said what the Confederacy and its symbols represented. And Brother Tom was helping me with this. Let me read what he said in a speech. The vice president Try, trying to get support for the Confederacy. He said, the new Constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating our peculiar institution, African slavery as it exists amongst us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. Jefferson, in his forecast, had anticipated this as the rock upon which the old union would split. He was right. What was conjectured with him is now a realized fact, but whether he fully comprehended the great truth upon which that rock stood and stands may be doubted. The prevailing ideas entertained by him and most of the leading statesmen at that time of the formation of the old constitution were that enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. It was evil they knew not well how to deal with, but the general opinion of the men of that day was that somehow or other in the order of providence the institution would be, uh, would pass away. This idea, though not incorporated in the Constitution, was the prevailing idea at the time. The Constitution it is true secured every essential guarantee to the institution while it should last and hence no argument can be justly urged against the constitutional guarantees thus secured because of the common sentiment of the day. Those ideas, however, were wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of the races. This was an error. It was a sandy foundation and the government built upon it fell when the storm came and the wind blew. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This is our new government, our new confederacy. It, this is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. This truth has been slow in the process of its development, like all other truths in the various departments of science. It has been so even amongst us. Many who hear me perhaps can recollect that this truth was not generally admitted even within their day. The errors of the past generation still clung to many as late as 20 years ago. Those at the North who still cling to these errors with zeal above knowledge, we justly de denominate fa fanatics. All fanaticism springs from an aberration of the mind from a defect in reason. It is species of insanity. One of the most striking characteristics of insanity in many instances is forming correct conclusion from fancied or erroneous premises. So it is with the anti-slavery fanatics. They have fancied and erroneous premises. Their co conclusions are right if their premises are wrong. They assume that the Negro is equal and hence conclude that he is entitled to equal privileges and rights with the white man. If their premises were correct, their conclusions would be logical but, and just. But their premise is wrong. And the whole argument fails. That was the justification. That's the heritage government. That's right. That's the heritage, Senator Berger. That's the heritage, Speaker Moore. That's the heritage that you want to permit. That's right. The truth is, the Confederacy was wrong then, and its philosophy and symbols and constitutions are just as wrong today. But I don't want to overshadow the danger. And then I want to make a big announcement at the end. 
I don't want to overshadow the danger because it's real. And governor, legislators, and any other persons that support this stuff, whatever happens, and I pray nothing, but it'll be on your record. Be on your record. Mm -hmm. And it concerns me when I think about my staff and team, not so much myself, because let me just read to you some messages we've gotten since they passed this bill. Blacks should not hold so much hate about their past as slaves, Confederate flags, and historical monuments. They should rather embrace their past. If it had not went the way it did, you'd still be in Africa. Dying of hunger, AIDS, and Ebola. Think about it. This, is, this was sent to the NAACP's office. Slavery was your ticket to the best country in the world. Yet you bitch and whine and complain. Barber, enough is never enough. I don't think blacks really hate items from the past. Rather, I think you people just hate yourselves. Governor, this is what you're unleashing. Here's another one that we, we've checked in the comment sections, the blog area, the comments after articles, because we have to monitor these things. When will you ever get over slavery two centuries ago and address the almost complete breakdown of the black family unit? It's like you guys aren't even ashamed about it. A flag and some monument are the least of your problem. That won't get anybody off their EBT card. Lower the stunning STD infection rate. Give a black child a father or keep blacks from killing each other. The lot of the black community will never improve until you stop feeling sorry for yourself and began to take moral responsibility. If you're gonna wait for the government to do it, you're gonna have a long wait. They want you hooked on that EBT card so you'll vote for them. Here's another one. The claim that the rebel flag means racism just because sometimes the Klan and other groups wave it around is just plain stupid because these groups use the American flag way more than the rebel flag. My rebel flag means precisely what I say is no more, no less. It means, and this may tickle some, but it doesn't tickle us who know the history and the danger. It means to me magnolia blossoms and honeysuckle smells, wading in the creek, June bugs and lightning bugs, feeling the cool grass under your feet on a hot day, people holding doors saying, yes ma'am, collard greens and butter game. But listen at this, I know that if these people keep pushing the good old boys, the good old boys are gonna push back and it won't be pretty. Mm -hmm. This governor, this legislature is what you're unleashing. Mm -hmm. This is why we need to show what we've here today. It's not just about black people. It's about all of us who wanna move forward. It's about all of us who recognize out of one blood God made everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That Confederate flag does not represent honor, it represents dishonor. That's right. Come on, let's say that. Again. It represents dishonor. That's right. That's right. It always has and it does not. It represents the protection of white supremacy. That's right. That's right. That's right. And if you push white supremacy to the nth degree, it means that you have a right to kill or destroy anybody that's not like you. That's dangerous. It's dangerous, yes, in the mind of Dalen Roof, but it is even more dangerous when it's supported by governors and legislatures of a state. Because it gives a legitimacy to it. And instead of protecting monuments and flags, we ought to be protecting justice and love and truth and community and uplift and America. And we ought to be fighting for one North Carolina. We ought to be fighting for our children. We ought to be fighting to be what we say on paper. A state where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. We ought to fight for what we say on paper. We ought to be a state where we are committed to be and not to seem. It is time for us to be just 
and to be anti-racist and to be for all people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's time for you to stop playing governor in the DNA, the political DNA of Ross Barnett and George Wallace and be a governor and a legislature for all the people. Because otherwise, by passing legislation like this, you are feeding your constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. And it's got to stop. And you ought to repeal, you ought to unaffix your signature. Do the moral thing. That's right. Unaffix your signature to that piece of legislation. Stand up and do what's right. And if the governor doesn't stand up, the legislature doesn't stand up, we ought to stand up. That's right. We ought to stand up with our voices. We ought to stand up at the ballot box. We ought to stand up in the courts. And let me conclude here by saying to my Democratic side of the aisle, you don't get off either. Because you had power for a long time and you didn't put up a monument to Ella Baker. You got to clap at that too now. Come on now. Come on now. You didn't put up a monument to Martin Luther King on the state ground. You didn't put up a monument to Abraham Galloway and J.W. Hood who helped write the Constitution. The black man that helped author the line in our Constitution that made public education a, a, a constitutional right in North Carolina. I come from a faith tradition that says sin is commission and omission. Wish I had a witness here. So we're calling, we're not Democrat, we're not Republican. We're calling for a moral society that where all of us live higher and higher and higher and higher until we're at higher ground. And here's the announcement. On August 29th, through August the 8th probably, September the 8th, the American Journey for Justice that left Selma this past week, 880 miles, all the way from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C., under the banner, our lives, our jobs, our schools, and our votes matter. As we march in direct action to force the United States Congress to fix the Voting Rights Act, to fully fund public education, to deal with discriminatory laws in our criminal justice system, Reverend Curtis Gatewood is going to be our coordinator. He's our HKMJ. He's going to be the coordinator for the American Journey for Justice and a whole host of team other folk. We have a meeting next week. We're going to walk 170 miles across North Carolina as our leg. Right. We, need, we need 170 people that will do the whole march. I need somebody that will lend me their leg since I can't do it all. We're going to have a rally in Raleigh on September the 3rd. We're going to have teach-ins. We're going to be staying in churches, not in hotels. And we need you to meet them along the way if you can't do the whole way. Because it's time, as I said two years ago, yes. about the moral movement. We are black. We are white. We are Latino. We are Asian. We are young. We are old. We are gay. We are straight. We are Christian. We are Muslim. We're Jewish. We're people who don't believe in a faith but believe in a moral universe. We're doctors. We're the sick. We're Republicans. We're Democrats. We're teachers. We're students. We are North Carolina and we ain't going nowhere. on that is that this is a movement that the world is looking at. Uh, you don't have to um, go anywhere to find a moral compass. You can just join the NAACP and the moral movement, the HK on J organizations, and you can be a part of something that has really taken over the world. Reverend Barber, we're lucky to have him here today because he's usually somewhere else yeah. telling them how to build a moral movement as we have done here.
I want to just uh, remind you that you have leadership here. Uh, Ms. Patricia Clayton from the North, uh, <laughs> North Orange NAACP, Barrett Brown from Alamance, and Reverend Campbell from Capitol Carborough. So, and any of us can help you to plug in because we need you to be a part of this movement. I want to introduce Reverend Richardson, who's going to give us the benediction, and he has a, a, an announcement about another way you can participate. Uh, thank you. On Saturday at 4 p.m. at First Community Baptist Church, we will continue this community dialogue, and I ask that uh, each one of you would come and also bring somebody with you. Um, uh, Reverend Bob was just so explicit and telling us about uh, and giving the history and so in those perspective of uh, our duties and what the flag represent, uh, et cetera. So please uh, mark your calendars, calendars for Saturday at 4 p.m. at First Community Baptist Church. Let us pray. Loving God, as we close this place of gathering and men and women of goodwill, we ask that you would empower all of us with the power of your strength, your love, and your grace so that men might know that you're God and all powers are in your hands. We ask your continued blessing on your servant, Brother Barber, and his staff. As they move from place to place, guide them and give them your light so that they might shed light to those who are in darkness. It is in your holy name we ask this prayer. Let us all say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. One announcement, one announcement. One announcement, real quick. Somebody just asked for Brother Hawkins. So you need to know that last Friday, our attorneys rested in the voting attack on uh, the voter suppression case, NAACP versus McCory. It was a powerful, powerful presentation. It's now in the hands of the judge. We are cautiously optimistic. At the end of the day, the only thing that the other side brought up, everything they said, they, the justification they put up was, was debunked, was proven that it wasn't a justification. And at the end of the day, they just basically said, well, we can do this because it's state policy. But the judge made one statement. He said, the government should not be in the business of making it harder for people to vote. <laughs> Powerful statement. Our lawyers were strong for more than almost two weeks. The voter ID portion of it, we, first of all, we've already won a first step on the voter ID because we forced them to change it. They didn't want to change it, but say that, we forced them to change it. And that's why they took it off the table, so it's going to be dealt with separately. And yesterday, the Sixth Circuit ruled against voter ID in Texas. So we're on the move. We're on the move. Now, on the 31st of August, as the American Journal for Justice is coming through, we go back to court in the state Supreme Court because the United States Supreme Court, five to four, sent our redistricting uh, court case back and said to our state, you did not even ask the right questions about race. That's a big, big victory for the Supreme Court to say, send it back and say, you gotta look at this again because you didn't do what was right. We go to trial on August the 31st about that case. So in the days to come, we're gonna be, in, we're gonna be doing a lot of litigation, a lot of agitation, and a lot of education because that is our vocation <laughs> with no limitations because when the next elections come after us, we're gonna have a celebration.